So tonight we're going to talk about um, isolation from God. And um, before I get into that, there are a couple things that came out of our, we have a group on um, Tuesday mornings. And that group, in that group, we work on the message together for tonight. So there's a whole lot of people that get together to work on the stuff that we're um, trying to introduce and teach on a Thursday night. And so Tuesday morning, a couple things came up about um, last Sun, last Thursday's message, and I wanted to get into a couple of those conversations really quick before we go on. One of them was I wanted to revisit this conversation I was having with, if you weren't here, you heard online or whatever, um, the second story of recovery. And like what I was talking about with the second story of recovery really wasn't, um, it really, it could have been, but it really wasn't about a um, secondary addiction. And sort of a secondary addiction is about like, let's just say my addiction is to pornography. And let's just say I go to, you know, I get into a treatment program for that and four months later, you know, I'm, I'm back and, and uh, back where, I, where, where I'm home for me and stuff and I'm there and working hard on my recovery and I decide that, you know, maybe I'll, um, what I'm gonna do is, you know, just to kind of get by and to feel a little bit okay, maybe I'll start having a beer a night and maybe it'll start turning into four or five beers a night in a month and a half and pretty soon it's six or eight beers and someone says to me, well, man, do you think you, I mean, you drink a lot. I mean, like, do you think you have a problem with alcohol? And they're saying that because, you know, by now I've gotten a DUI and some other stuff has happened. And I go, no, that really wasn't my problem. I mean, my addiction, you need to get it right. I mean, my addiction was pornography. My addiction really was not alcohol. But see, like for those of us that have a compulsion, here's the reality about our brains, right? We have this deal about the fact that we can and will develop a compulsion for anything. Amen? And so like if you're like, well, you know, I mean, I used to have this big league problem with uh, pain meds, but now I just drink beer. It's like, you're not sober. Well, I used to have this big league thing with... Uh, you know, with, with meth or whatever, it's like, and now I, you know, now I just like watch a lot of stuff, stuff online. You're not sober. Or maybe you've turned to gambling. You're not sober. Or maybe it's, and it's every time we use the phrase, just, right? It's just, well, that's, that's the conversation about, you know, a second story of recovery relative to a compulsion. Last week, what I was talking about was the second story of recovery, meaning there's a surface level story, and that is, I've got this problem with alcohol, I've got this problem with sex, I've got this problem with eating, I've got this problem with a relationship, codependency, whatever, and you know that's the problem that I'm immediately addressing because I'm in the most crisis about that problem, right? You following me? But see, like underneath of that story lives what I was talking about, which is the second story. And the second story is, what it is that happened in my life that I'm trying to run from, that I'm trying to avoid, that has caused me to develop this masking opportunity using my compulsion of choice. Are you following me? What's the story behind the action that is immediate to everybody? What does everybody not know? We talk a lot in this room about the fact that for a lot of us, the secondary story is an abuse or a molestation or an abandonment but it could be a lot of things. And so that's what I was talking about um, with that. And then the other thing that we talked about Tuesday was, did all of us understand what I was talking about when I said, you know, in order to deal with your second story in your life, you've got to take Jesus back to where that happened to you. And like what I was trying to say is that, you know, sometimes we think that, well, we've got to go back and face the most, the toughest day in our life the worst situation of anything we've ever been through, the most horrible thing we experienced, the deepest pain we've ever had. And because I haven't finished the business about that, whatever that is, right, I gotta go back there by myself and I gotta deal with it. And what I was trying to say last week is take Jesus back there with you and let him begin to do the healing work in you. Amen? All right. So does that make sense? I figured it makes sense to you guys and it was just my group that was confused. It's turned out now over four minutes I was right. Y'all got it the whole time, didn't you? Yeah, that's right, so. When we have a relationship with God and maybe you know it's fine if you don't have one because this is about what'll happen when you do have one. 
You don't, you know, you don't got to be a Christian to come to a place like this. You, you don't have to have a relationship with God. But if you did, or if you do, isn't it true, don't you think, that for most of us, we're pretty, we're pretty belligerent, I guess. We're pretty adamant about um, only giving up certain pieces of ourselves to God. Am I right? And like mostly, I don't know if this is the way you are, but I tend to give up pieces of me that I decide are completely helpless. I can't do anything with that part of me or my life. And so I throw it up to God. I mean, the thing about that is, is why not? Why not submit to God something that you've already completely, you know, is, is just completely unchangeable for you, right? Where you've completely given up. Who cares? What's the difference? Right? But see, I want to talk about what that's really all about. Because what that's really all about, when I piecemeal my life with God and say, well, God, I'll give you this part over here. It's kind of like if you've been in high school, you've been in college, and you have, I don't, this I'm sure never happened to you guys, but like, let's just say hypothetically to someone that you know, like, you know, maybe it did to someone, but you had this class in high school or college, and I mean, you can, some of you are getting anxious right now. You're getting a little sweaty because you're thinking about, yeah, it's almost finals time where a week ago it was, and I remember what it was like, right? When you somehow, it dawned on you, if you were in college, that, you know, maybe I should have gone to that class more than three times. <laughs> the whole, the whole stupid grade is based on the final, and I mean, I went three times. Maybe in high school, it's like, I maybe should have taken at least two pages of notes about this class, because the final's tomorrow. So you scramble around and you call, your first thing you do is you call your friends. You got any notes? I wonder if you could help me out. I wonder if you could study with me. It's like, no, you're not gonna study with you. They're gonna study for you. And so like, you see if you can get them to come over and have a little study deal and so you get everything you can. You know, and then you get, now it's two o'clock in the morning. You're starting to realize, man, I can't read 2,700 pages worth of stuff tonight. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know, Jack, about this whole biology thing. It was cool cutting up the frog, but the frog was already dead. I mean, I didn't really know. I don't know anything about why we did that. I just like messing with the frog leg. If you're a guy, you probably loved it that you could like you could torch up the frog a little bit. You know, people did that. Electri I saw guys electrocute the frog. That was fun, right? Stuff like that. But it never dawned on you. The professor or the teacher is trying to get you to learn about anatomy. What is that? And now it's 2.30 in the morning. And here comes the prayer of desperation. God, I'm telling you, <laughs> if you could get me through this biology class, I'll be yours forever. I'm telling you, God, you, you are the man. You can get this done. I know, God, if you could create the world, certainly you had biology. Amen? I mean, after all, you made this frog. Come on, God, I'll give you all the credit if you can just get me through biology. That ought to be right down the line with you. I mean, you're God. This ought to be simple. And of course, the next day, you got an F. <laughs> and you try to somehow figure out some way to express your disappointment in God. Man, I thought you'd come through for me, man. God says, well, I didn't think you'd come through for me. I mean, I watched you screw up that class the whole way. See, we're, we're very good at giving God stuff that we don't have any way to manage, Amen. But see, well, when I get to these steps that we work with here in this place, and someone, I, I gotta get this place going, look at uh, step one, I'm powerless. Over, this isn't like I am powerless over this scenario. I am powerless over the fact that if a semi going at 80 miles an hour down highway, uh, Interstate 40, heading west towards Nashville, were to be going down in the right lane, and I were to stand in the right lane, and I were to mark my spot right there in the right lane, I would be powerless over being able to stop that truck. That's pretty much our view, at least in the first blush of all this, of what powerless is. Like, I'm powerless over things I should be powerless over, amen? But like, if you're codependent, try to read it this way. I'm powerless over my wife and what she's gonna do. I'm powerless over my children. I'm powerless over, over my husband. It's like, I am not. I mean, I'll be powerless over the semi, but I am not powerless over that other stuff. I don't want God involved in that. If I wanted God, now we won't say this because we're more polite because we're in the South. 
But I want, if I wanted God involved in my business, I'd tell him. And you won't say that. You'll just say, bless your heart. But that's what you'll say. <laughs> yeah, bless your heart, God. Bless your heart. We only want God in our business where we want God in our business. Amen? But see, it ain't like that. When you're the creator of the universe and you're the creator of everything around you, <laughs> your business is everybody's business. And there is no business, there is no business that isn't your business. You know, like, if you're a teenager, I mean, some of us act like spiritual teenagers our whole life. You know, you sit there and your parents, your parents have this house, right? And if you have teenagers, you know where this is gonna go, don't you? You're the parent, you bought the house, the mortgage has your name on it, amen? There was, a, there was a Target bill sitting in your car for $88. If you have girls, that was just for shoes. <laughs> one pair. You're the one that's got the college account going on. You're the one that just bought $200 worth of stuff at Publix or Costco or wherever. You follow me so far? You just paid a $300 utility bill, and your daughter goes, get out of my room. And most codependent parents go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. What to, what to, what to, what to, what to do? I think she's upset with me. It's like, what was your first clue? Because following right on the heels of that is probably going to be, if she's mad enough, is going to be, and I hate you. It's like, you can still hate me and all that, but it's still my house and that's still my room and you're just kind of in there and that's the way it goes. We just don't think that, see? But God... When you're God, every piece of Mark Beebe belongs to him. The pieces, now get this, and this is what would keep me sick. The pieces that I acknowledge I will give him, the pieces I'm not sure if I should give him, and the pieces I refuse to give him, they all belong to God. We are so good at wanting to isolate this. So well, I, want to, I only want God to be involved in the stuff in my life that's a train wreck, the stuff that I don't understand, the stuff that would be miraculous in nature. You know, I walked in, I go into, I don't do this, but I go into, into Weigel's, you know, I buy four lottery tickets. I'm $21,000 in debt. I start praying to God when I get to my car, please, please let me just win the lottery. I'll give you 10%, it'll be good. We're isolators, aren't we? And we are also, we're also gonna work hard, all of us are, at being spiritual dictators. Man, we wanna tell God how it's gonna be. We think when we're in a relationship with God, we're at some kind of retail establishment where we pick and choose what we want, how we want it, when we want it, and how much we're gonna pay. And we're doing God a favor, by the way, by giving him a piece of us, amen? But here's the news for tonight. Do you know the peace? Do you guys know the peace of my life that I keep? This is by design, not God's. I keep the peace of my life that is going to, that is bound to keep me sick. That is the peace I hold on to the tightest. Amen. That is the piece of me that I hold on to the tightest is the piece that keeps me sick. Now, do I know that? I, I might know that. I might not be aware of that. It's still true. It's true for a lot of us that we have actually gotten comfortable with our own bondage. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, we have gotten comfortable with our own bondage. Someone, someone today that I ran into was talking to me about a relationship that they're in, and she was like, yeah, you know, I'm in this relationship, and this guy, and he, I mean, every time he calls me, it's just a messed up conversation, and it's really abusive, and, and uh, man, I don't know what to do, what to do, what to do. And I said, well, what you do is you either A, change your number, 
She had 19,000 reasons why she couldn't do that. B, get somebody to block your number. How do I do it? What to do? Go to your carrier. They'll do it for you. Yeah. But see, that, that right there is what she was going to hold on to that was keeping her sick. Amen? Because God wasn't going to get a hold of that. She needed to have that for some reason to somehow make sense of the fact that she was stuck. Like when you're stuck in your life, the only worse thing than being stuck is being stuck without an excuse. Am I right? Well, I'd change if that witch would stop saying to me what she says. I would change if I didn't have such a horrible job. I would change if, I, if this happened over here. If she stopped, if he stopped, if they stopped, if you stopped, if it stopped, if the weather changed, if whatever, man, I would change. I would, I mean, if all this happened the way I wanted it, oh, I would give it up to God. I would give it up to God. It just isn't like that. I mean, I'm not sure who we think we're talking about in this room, if that's the way we see our deal with God, but it's just not like that. It's not like that. I mean, we're not talking about the Wizard of Oz. We're talking about God. We're not talking about an old man behind a curtain that's spinning some crazy wheels. We're talking about God. We're talking about the loving resurrection power of God. But see, we get comfortable with our stuff. Who do you think, who do you guys think benefits from you or me keeping things off limits from God in our life? Keeping things unsubmitted in our life from God. Listen, number one, it's not God that benefits. That's clue number one. Clue number two, we don't benefit. Well, who's left? The enemy. The only person in this room tonight that benefits from you withholding your, all of you from God, submitting all of you to God, <laughs> would be the enemy. That's it. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. This is right when he was about to get started with his public ministry of three years and a little bit, and right after he was baptized. Right after he was baptized. Don't ever think that because you start to develop a deep relationship with Jesus or a deep relationship with God, that challenge isn't coming your way. Let me just tell you, the minute you put yourself into the arms of God, into the arms of Jesus, the enemy is gonna be furious with you. And everything that's, everything that's going on inside of you is gonna get jacked up times 10. Right away, Jesus goes from his baptism, amen. Right away, Jesus goes from his baptism, <clears throat> and he goes out there to the, this wilderness. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the enemy for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing at that time and became very hungry. And so now Jesus is vulnerable. He's got a choice to make. He can turn his vulnerability and his hunger over to his father, or he can allow his hunger to become bondage in the hands of the enemy. And so the liar says to him, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus tells him, no, the scriptures say people don't live by bread alone. Then the devil says to him, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. He said, no, I don't live like that. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I'll give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them because they are mine to give anybody I please. And this, he's talking to Jesus. Jesus is fully aware of who, where he came from, who he belonged to, and what his authority was, right? He is fully aware of the fact that he is fully God. He is fully aware of the fact that he has emptied himself of all of his, all of his 
God authority in order to take on the form of a servant like you and I in order to understand us, love us more deeply, and eventually shed his blood for us as us. And now you got the enemy going, let's see, I'll show him. I know what will really get to Jesus. That would be power, right? Because that's what it doesn't have now. I'll, I will threaten him with, I'll give him the, the, the uh, inducement of power. He'll take that. Jesus says, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Only is a big word. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, the highest point of the temple, and <clears throat> said, if you're the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus said, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, who as now a full man was a fully submitted man to the authority of his father. When Jesus, Jesus wrote <coughs> the third step, amen, Jesus wrote the first step. Jesus wrote the second step. I can go on down. You heard those steps. No average person made those up. The third step talks exactly about what I'm talking about tonight. Made a decision to turn all of my life and all of my will, thank you, over to the care and love and concern of God. all. And he did that right there out in the wilderness with the enemy right there. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. See, the whole deal is there's going to be a next. Like the closer you are to your father as God, the more that opportunity is going to be there. And it will be that one place in my life or that one place in your life, or those five places in my life, or those five places in your life, that are unsubmitted, that you don't want God to touch, that I don't want God to touch, that are gonna be our places of extreme and intense vulnerability, amen? Extreme and intense vulnerability. People never relapse because of a craving. They relapse because of a brokenness. Amen. We don't relapse because of a craving. We relapse for whatever our compulsion is, we relapse from a brokenness. I want to talk to you about a guy in the Bible that followed Jesus around. His name was Peter. And Peter was one of the early followers of Jesus, one of the 12 guys that spent a lot of time with him over three years. And Peter, man, he had all kinds of problems. And so I was gonna walk you through, I guess what we call the Peter experience tonight, relative to kind of what I was just reading out of Jesus and his experience with the enemy out in the wilderness. The first thing that Jesus did not have that Peter did have this is like an add-on to the Jesus stories. Peter had a definite ability to see himself as being, at least initially, as invincible. Amen? If you read any of the four major stories about Jesus in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you will pick up this arrogance and this independence and this I know all of it and I'm invincible attitude and perspective about Peter. You'll see it in this guy. Every single time Jesus says something Peter don't want to hear, like, you know, look, in order for me to bring about the salvation of the world, the thing is I got to die on a cross. Peter's like, not you. Never going to happen. Don't want to hear it. Want a different story. Jesus has all kinds of problems with this guy. You know, stuff like that comes up with stuff like, get behind me, Satan. Huh, that's pretty tough right there. So Peter has this invincibility. 
His invincibility brings about a lack of his ability to believe that he will actually betray, outright betray Jesus straight up. Anybody here ever been betrayed? It's got to be one of the most heart-sinking, just gut-wrenching, soul-searching things that's ever going to happen to you. Someone that you loved, someone that you trusted, someone that you counted on, someone that you believed in. Man, they just lied right to you. Or they absolutely blew you up in front of somebody else. Or they just completely let you down. Broke your heart. And that's what's going to happen to, to Jesus in Peter's hands. Jesus tells him, you're going you're gonna to say you don't know me. You're going to walk away from me. You're going to cover your own skin. You're going to look out for yourself. Peter, never me. That invincibility, I'd never do it. Never going to do it. Never, never, never. Never, never, never. Three hours later, there we were. And so Peter's got to reckon with his hunger. And see, in the story of Jesus, it was about physical hunger. In the story of Peter, it's about a hunger of fear. He's got to deal with this hunger of fear. He's afraid he might die. He don't want any part of that. He's still in it to look out for number one. He is on the run, most likely, while Jesus is dying on a cross. He's as far away from Jesus as he can be on that day, probably. Peter, in his walking through the process of submitting all of Peter to God, starts with that invincibility, goes through that rejection of God. We all, somewhere in our life, know something about that prayer, don't we? God, where are you? Where were you? Why did you? Why didn't you? We know this. It ain't just Peter. Peter then has an experience of despair. And in his despair, he, he can barely stand to be with himself. And you just know that that's going on on that day of Jesus' crucifixion when he's on the run. And when he meets Jesus, every bit of those first three things, Jesus, because he loves him, and because he knows that in order for Peter, and just like me, and just like you, for us to be free from ourselves, for the healing from our Father, for healing from Jesus, for freedom, we gotta be free of all the stuff in our life that we wanna hang on to. Jesus is gonna to attend to his invincibility and his betrayal and his despair. Because one day, after his resurrection, Jesus comes back and he's in a room with Peter. And Jesus offers him hope, maybe for the first time that, you know, I saw what you did. I saw who you are. I know you inside and out. I watched you walk away from me. And Peter, I still love you. I love you. I'm back to see you. You're just not randomly in the room. I came back to see you, man. Despite, despite, despite. I don't know what's on your list, but man, it, I gotta tell you, read the story of Peter. It can't be worse. You're like, you don't know. Man, read the story. Despite, 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 Jesus was there for him. Despite, despite, despite whatever has happened in your life, Jesus is here for you tonight. Despite, despite, despite. And that's what, I mean, that's what hope is. The freedom of hope, the action step of hope, the action step of a confidence in God is this total submission step that I'm talking about, really step three. All of my life, all the stuff I don't wanna talk about, all the stuff I've tried to avoid thinking about, 
all the stuff I've tried to avoid feeling, all that stuff has got to come forward and I got to submit it, lay it down in front of Jesus tonight. You're like, man, you don't understand. That's a load. It's fine. It's fine. Here's a question that um, this guy Oswald Chambers asked that I think is haunting in a lot of ways. He says, can Jesus see the agony of his soul in you? And man, there's two ways, there's really two ways to look at that. First way to look at that is tonight, can Jesus see what he paid for through his shed blood going on in your life? And that is hope, that is newness, that is encouragement, that is resurrection, that is freedom. But then there's another truth here, and that is this, is that can Jesus see the agony of his soul in you? Is he suffering tonight because you and or I, because we're unwilling to submit hardly any of ourselves to his healing, to his resurrection, to his cleansing, to his loving, to his grace. And man, I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know how much, I don't know how much you have left in your life to lay down. I suspect for a lot of us, just because we are who we are, it's a lot. It's a lot. You know, a few, a few um, weeks ago, we wrote names on walls all over this building, and we wrote them on there because we, wanted to, we want people's names to go on there, and maybe you put your own name on there, but that you wanted to pray for that they might meet Jesus. So I want to ask you a question. How many walls do you think we would need to put everything in your life and everything in my life that was not submitted tonight up on these walls? And how long would we be at the wall? Because I don't know a whole lot. I mean, I'm not that smart of a guy, but I know this. I know that until we do that work and we write everything down into the heart of Jesus, until we're completely empty and he starts over, we're never, ever gonna be free. I wanna thank you for coming tonight. This altar is open for prayer. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.